In this episode of the Business of E-Commerce, I talk with Ben Weider about how to build a truly great brand. This is the Business of E-Commerce, episode 110. Welcome to the Business of E-Commerce, the show that helps e-commerce retailers start, launch, and grow the e-commerce business. I'm your host, Charles Pileski, and I'm here today with Ben Weider. Ben is the founder of Chassis, a men's skincare product. Ben is also a branding expert, a published author, and the owner of Level 6 Marketing, a full-service brand performance agency. I asked Ben on the show today to talk about how you can build a truly great brand. So, hey, Ben, how are you doing today? Great, Charles. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome to have you on the show. So, I kind of kept it short in the intro, but can you explain what Chassis is? Kind of just throw it at a men's product, but I think you'd be better equipped to... Uh, <laughs> Explain that one. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. Yeah, so so chassis we've really transformed uh, men's grooming, uh, really for for um, hundreds of thousands of men at this point. And um, you know, if you look at uh, the men's grooming space, you know, there's there's uh, clearly defined uh, roles for you know shaving. Obviously, is a very familiar thing. Um, you know, fragrances, things of that sort. But um, there's one area that we, that we recognized when we launched uh, in in late 2015, and that was uh, the area of uh, what we call, and our tagline is man care for down there, basically powder for guys. Um, guys have been using powder to uh, prevent sweat and odor and chafing um, for uh, hundreds of years, actually. And um, But they've always been using products that weren't actually designed for that purpose. Uh, many times it's baby powder. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, what they would call medicated powder. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, people are familiar with that term. Um, usually it smells either like a baby or an old man. Um, it usually doesn't work great. It works okay. Um, so we had this idea, you know, could we make a better powder and then could we build a brand around it? And that's what, that's what chassis is. So this is actually have it just so anyone wants to see that's, uh, this is one of our products. This is our, our ice powder. Um, and, uh, this is a extra cooling one. I just haven't have, uh, sitting around and, um, but you know, that's, that's kind of what it is. We have a couple other products. We have a, a shower primer, um, and, a, a restoration cream that, uh, complement the powders as well. And, um, you know, it's been going great. It's funny. A, a lot of guys use baby powder. It's one of those things in like the, in the locker room at the gym. Um, mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, that guy smells like, a, you know, like a three-year-old, which is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And, 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 and so we had a theory that guys, if we were upfront about it, if we just had an honest conversation in a very mature way, not sophomoric, that they would respond really well to it. And, and, and it's been, it's been amazing. Um, you know, we're, we're, uh, number one in our category, um, on Amazon, um, which is obviously a very important place to be number one. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've, uh, actually inspired many followers. Um, so there's that first mover strategy. We've got, um, a whole lot of new competitors that didn't exist, uh, three years ago, four years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, so now, you know, there's a little bit of that playing defense, um, that we've got to do, um, but you know, to still, you know, maintain our, our market leadership. Yeah. So how long ago was it that you started? So it was late 2015. 2015 okay. um, yeah. So we can almost say, you know, early 2016. Um, and, uh, you know, we were you know, fully out there and, um, you know, it's, it's been, it's been gangbusters ever since, uh, you know, we grow year over year. Um, you know, we continue to enhance the product line, introduce new products. Uh, we've got a, uh, a new one coming out here, uh, before the end of the year that we're really excited about that I can't quite talk about just yet. Um, you know, so it's, it's been great. And so, and before that, so you currently, you still are, or you were, um, a partner in a marketing agency as well, right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. I founded uh, level six, uh, we're a full service marketing agency, um, uh, in 2005. And, you know, when you, uh, run a marketing firm, uh, like level six, um, you know, there are regular opportunities that present themselves, you know, just organically, you're going to talk to startups and things like that. And, um, oftentimes those conversations lead to, you know, would you like a little piece of, of, of this company, you know, in exchange for, you know, services. And so, um, chassis is an example of that. Um, you know, I was uh, in the very early days that when, when, uh, my co-founders came to me and, and we started having the conversation, um, you know, I, I said, look, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to be a part of this. Um, and so, you know, we, we run everything out of the same office, um, different teams, obviously. Um, but it's a, it's a really good model. It's worked really well for us. And there's a lot of synergy back and forth. You know, we still have our clients on the agency side and I've got a lot of help 
you know, from an employment standpoint with some great people on the agency side, but I've also got a lot of great uh, teammates on, on the chassis side of things too. Okay. So this was somebody who came to you as a marketing client. So someone came and they said, I have a idea for a product or they had some product background. Yeah. And you said, well, in this case, it was actually my brother's. Oh, okay. So well, brother, there you go. So it wasn't yeah. somebody, so, it was just your brother's. So, this was a little unusual. This one okay. was my brother's. Usually it's not my brother's, but they came and said, look, we've got this idea. Um, and I said, you know, that's a good idea, but I may have a better one. And I just, it's something that I had saved for a rainy day. I threw it out there. Um, they loved it instantly. Um, we, work together to hone that idea. Um, and then, uh, you know, the rest is history. So it took, took a long time to get it off the ground. Um, uh, because when, you know, the, the dirty little secret of, of the beauty industry or, or grooming industry, as we would say for men is that most products are, are what we call derivative products. So what you would do is you would go to a chemist and you would say, I want to make the world's best uh, powder. And the chemist would normally say, well, what's the best powder that you know of so far? And I need to start with that formula and then make it better. Okay. So what's your benchmark? Then I'm just going to add maybe one new ingredient, maybe a new fragrance, throw it in a new package and we call it a day. So almost everything you see when you walk up and down the aisles, you know, of a target, let's say, um, are derivative products. They've, they've evolved over time. You start with whatever you think the benchmark is and you make it a little bit better, right? In the world of powder, uh, we found that that wasn't working. You know, we went through a few chemists who sort of operated the same way, but, you know, we quickly realized that, you know, if you're just going to take baby powder and add a different fragrance, it's not really any better. I mean, it smells better, sure, but it's not really any better. And that's, um, it was tough. I mean, we, cause that's the way that it really works. And, um, at the 11th hour, we found a, a chemist out of California. Uh, we were ready to throw in the towel and this guy's name is John. And I said, John, look, here's what we're trying to do. I don't know if you can help us, but we really need to start from scratch, you know, all new product that's never been done before. And he immediately said, I can make you the world's best powder. I know how to do this. Cause I've actually, he actually said, I've thought about this myself. I'm a powder guy. It's going to be expensive, you know, not, not the, um, uh, not his costs, but the, the actual cost of goods, the formulation itself is going to be expensive to, to do what you want. Um, and I said, that's fine. We don't care. We just want the world's best powder. We'll figure out how to sell it later. You know, if it's good enough, it's going to sell. So, I mean, to this day, we're the most expensive powder out there. You know, I mean, it's it lasts a long time, um, you know, for $20, uh, which is our, our MSRP. I mean, it you know, most people will get, you know, at least three months out of a bottle. Most people get well over six months out of a bottle. So when you when you break it down that way, it's not bad, but it's certainly more than a, you know, three dollar bottle of baby powder, you know. But but again, we're out selling that because there's value there. People understand they use it and it's, it's really comparing apples to oranges when you look at what this stuff does compared to, you know, traditional products. What was, your, was it your background or your brother's background? Bro brothers, right? Plural. Mm -hmm. uh, was it your, one of your brother's background or your background to know to engage with a chemist and start that process? Like how did you even, cause most people yeah. wouldn't know to do that. Yeah. So, uh, my, my one, uh, brother who's, who's most active with me in, in, in chassis Noah. Um, yeah, he actually came from, uh, uh, CPG consumer packaged goods, uh, specifically in the, in the, uh, grooming areas. So he had a little bit of a background, just enough to be dangerous. I mean, he didn't, you know, he was more on the, the sales and marketing side, but he knew enough to be dangerous. Um, and, and to be honest, it was a lot of trial and error. I mean, you know, we, we hired and fired, three other chemists before we found John. So, I mean, it gives you an idea, uh, you know, this stuff isn't easy. Um, there's, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, trial and error and, and, uh, you just got to kind of work through it. And I think that it really, it's it, honestly, chassis is a story of perseverance because, um, you know, I didn't understand the derivative nature of these, of product development in, in the beauty space until we did this. I mean, now that I understand it, I now understand to explain that, you know, whenever we're going to develop a new product that, Hey, you know, we got to start with a blank slate. Um, but the fact of the matter is I'd say 95% of those out there in this space, they don't want to do it that way. You know? So if you, if you find the right guy, um, or, or, the, or the right girl to do it, you know, it, you can, you can really, uh, make a pretty good impact in, in, in whatever you're trying to do. Yeah. It sounds like that's one of those lessons you would never, I would never think of that going into it. I think most people wouldn't. You would kind of just go talk to the first couple people, take their word as face value, and you know, kind of just say, okay, let's just add some fragrance on top of this and call yeah. it. And that's like that's how that's how I, everyone does I, it. 
and, and I will say this. I mean, not to sell ourselves short. I mean, we got really, really nerdy in the process. Okay. I mean, myself in particular, I mean, we had a conversation the other day, um, w with our chemist, John, cause like I said, we're developing some other products right now. And I don't remember what the ingredient was, but I, I, I was talking about this ingredient and off the top of my head, I said, well, correct me if I'm wrong. The reason that we want to increase the percentage of that ingredient would be to do X, Y, Z. And he goes, that's exactly right. And he, and, and it's just because I think to do it, you, you, um, as a brand leader have to understand what you're putting in there. I understand every one of the ingredients that we have in here. I know what they do. I know where they're sourced from. I know why we put them in there. I even know the safety rating of every single ingredient in here. And, you know, I mean, that was done purposefully. So it was a little different. And, 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 and John has even told us that, um, number one, he had to have an open mind and he also had to have <clears throat> really no ego going into it because we came to him with a, a list of, you know, maybe 20 or 30 possible ingredients that we thought should be included in, in, in our original chassis powder. Um, and he, he took that seriously. Now they couldn't all work for, you know, different, you know, uh, scientific reasons that are way above, you know, my level, but he looked at our, our list of ingredients and said, you know what, some of these actually make sense. You know, it's never been done before, but, um, I mean, we, we went through as a team, and this is no exaggeration, went through all of the ingredients in the uh, EWG uh, database, um, which is like the entire database of, of, of personal care products, basically, and um, researched every single one of them and broke them all down and, and started winnowing down, winnowing down. And then that's how we got with that list. And that's how, you know, we gave him something to work with, um, you know, and he's told us that's highly unusual. But I think it's also highly unusual, A, for us to do it, but B, to have a chemist with thick enough skin and, you know, no ego to think that, hey, maybe my customers actually know what they want. You know, maybe they have a point there. Right. And maybe we can work together to make something truly world class. And so, you know, I think it's that uh, synergy that, that really got us to where we are. It's always amazing when I talk to retailers, this is this spectrum, right, of people that at one end just kind of resell someone else's products. They know very little. Um, they're just kind of like a pure marketing machine all the way to someone that does this like artisanal handcrafted something and there's just like and there's a whole gray area in between it definitely sounds yeah. like you guys are more towards very deep inside the product uh, um very specific yeah. um Ab very absolutely focused. okay absolutely i think you know um you know, I, I think because here's the other thing from a marketing standpoint, it's, it's easier to build a premium brand. I think um, I've built plenty of commodity brands as well, um, you know, from the agency side. And I think there's there's different ways that you do that. Um, but I think, you know, for me, you know, when you consider that, you know, we're, we're the most expensive um, in our space and the market leader at the same time, I mean, that's when you know you're achieving something. You know, that's when you know you've, you've reached it. And, and I have a client of mine. Um, I have a, a, a large client of mine on the agency side. They're in the automotive industry um, in, in trucks. Um, and, you know, they're basically the most expensive truck out there. And they're also number one market share at the same time, you know, which is, again, I think that's, that's when you know you're doing something right because you're selling value, right? They're selling value. We're selling value. At the end of the day, I mean, it's still – you know, their truck might only be a little bit more than the next truck, but it's going to get better fuel economy. It's going to last longer. It's going to have a better warranty. It's going to have better resale value and on and on and on and on. And that's how they're able to, to make it all work. And I think, you know, um, I've always admired them. And I think in, in much the same way, you know, um, I've tried to model a lot of what we're doing at Chassis you know, off of them. Hmm. So when you say, so you've worked with other, um, you know, you put yourself as a premium brand and what, what was the term you used for other uh, commodity brands? Commodity so, brands, right? Yeah, what, I mean, and so what, what would yeah. you say? What is the what's the difference marketing? Like, what are some of the things? Because it's almost like a completely different process, a whole different mindset. Marketing right. a premium versus a commodity brand. Like, yeah, and and there's gray areas. I yeah. think first of all, it's always you, you're walking on thin ice when you try to explain to a client that they have a commodity brand, right? Because I mean, they don't want to hear that, you know. So let's say uh, we have a client that's in insurance. Um, and in, in their space, um, and they have a very good insurance product. It's a great insurance product. Okay. And they believe it's the best insurance product in the space. And it, and it, and it very, it very well may be, I mean, they're, they're the market leader in the, in the state of Florida for what they do. But at the same time, I bet you, if I talk to their, 
direct competitor, they would think they have the best insurance product for the state of Florida, right? So, um, you know, at the end of the day, to a consumer, when they're looking at insurance, as, a, as an example, you know, does it have the coverage I need, and is it priced right? You know, the, that's really what they care about, um, and and do I have confidence in that product? So, um, you know, I think that with commodity products, it's a lot about selling familiarity, right? Familiarity is a really big thing with commodity products. You want somebody to feel like I know this brand already. You know, this isn't like some fly by night company because, you know, they check, you're checking off boxes, you know, where when you talk about chassis, you're talking about a premium product, you know, you're selling an experience a little bit more. Um, you're telling a brand story a little bit more. Um, you know, there's just, it's, it's a, a little bit of a deeper connection. Um, you know, that's why, you know, a name like chassis that, you know, once you get it, once you understand that's like the undercarriage of a car, you know, most guys are like, oh my God, that's, that's pretty genius. You know, the name for, you know, for the, for that brand. But at the same time, a lot of guys don't even know what a chassis is. You know, a lot of guys aren't car guys anymore. They've never heard of it. They don't even know how to pronounce it. They think it's a French word or something like that. <laughs> and, and, you know, that, but that's okay too. That's worked well for us. I think the fact that, you know, maybe we are from France. I don't know, you know, and, and I think there's that little mystery behind it. And, you know, you look at, um, you know, package design on a premium product. Um, you know, I talk about this all the time that, um, you know, if you look at, at our bottle, sorry to hold it up again, but, you know, you'll notice there's a lot of white space here, right? You notice there's only a couple colors on it too, right? We don't have the whole rainbow. We don't have metallic. We don't have shadows, gradients. It's, it's clean, it, it looks high end. I mean, it's, it's probably one of the biggest anomalies in design that the simpler the design, the higher end it appears, um, which is highly counterintuitive, right? I mean, you would think that the more involved designs might be the better products, but in fact, that's really not how it works. So it's, yeah, it's one of those strange things with design. It's literally of like higher end brands, like a I'm trying to, Easy example, like a stereo, right? You go into this like cheap stereo store, the, the, the cheap ones have like flashy knobs and everything, but then you go into start the higher end ones. They're literally just these basic black boxes. Yeah. And like a Denon, Denon or Denon, whatever yeah, they're pronouncing. Denon, yeah. uh, Denon, what, Denon, whatever. Yeah. It's the most boring design in the world. Right. But the sound is just like ridiculous exactly. over the top thing. And then you yeah. go into these like basic, you know, Panasonic ones in Walmart and they have like flashing lights and like, it looks well, like a carnival. It, 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 and, and, and think about it this way, like, so you, and you, there's the other end of the spectrum and this is not what we wanted to do, but look at, look at Bose, for example. And I, I hope I don't get any bad emails from Bose, but, um, I was at a, uh, a charity event the other day where the giveaway for the event was this, um, Bose, um, all in one speaker thing. I mean, it was like a $250, you know, giveaway, you know, I think I forget what it's called, but, um, it looks beautiful, you know, has the Bose brand name on it. Um, it sounds good, you know, I mean, it's not bad, but it, it, but it definitely doesn't sound as good as a true high end, um, audio product would. Now there are those that would say what I think that what I'm saying is crazy. Like no way Bose is the greatest sound of anything that ever existed in the history of audio. Um, but you know, they've created a brand that makes you believe that they've created a very clean design. They don't have a million different products, you know, um, they, you know, they, they, they do what they do. Well, you're never going to have a bad experience. You're never going to plug a Bose speaker and it sounds like garbage. You know, it may not be Denon quality or something like that, but you know, I mean, I think that that's, uh, that's their, that's their space. They've found a niche and I mean, obviously they're, it's, it's, it's working for them. Yeah. Cause once you get that, it, there, it, because once you get over a certain tear, right, then you become into like this audiophile, like specialty, you know, the guy right. that wants to spend $20,000 on a stereo and yeah. it's basically the, the, the weird rich person audiophile uh, niche, yeah. which is a whole yeah, different I mean, thing you, than a Bose. I mean, you, yeah, exactly. I was in, uh, uh, have you ever been to Apt in uh, Chicago before? That's that huge electronic superstore in, in suburban Chicago. Um, they, I was in there uh, a few months ago and um, they had a, 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 a pair of speakers. I believe that the price was $150,000 for this pair of speakers. I mean, it sounded amazing, <laughs> but you know, Hey, someone's buying it, I guess. Yeah. And, there, and there's a group for that, but Bose hits that perfect kind of thing where it's the average person who wants to have a really nice stereo, but doesn't mm -hmm. really want to go to those, you know, 
That's right. Ridiculous it, speakers. Um, it's good enough. Good enough. It's, you know, it's good enough and it, and the design is great and it's going to work. And, you know, there's a, there's a reliability there, you know, that there's a brand promise. They, they may not surpass that brand promise, but they're going to reach it every time. Yep. Now, how do you find, so how do you know where you are in that kind of spectrum and then find those customers that want that level, right? Cause you don't, there's, if you go, if you're trying to say with a, best in the world, but only this, like, you know, we're offering $500 a bottle and it's like specialist, but that's right. not, you don't want to be that, you know, that special. You, you just but you have don't to want believe to be. in what you're, yeah, you gotta, you gotta find your niche and then yep. you gotta stay in your lane. I think that that's, that's how, that's what I believe, right? So whatever that niche is, and you can do all the market research in the world, the, you know, the third party panel studies, the, uh, you know, statistical analysis, however you want to arrive at, at, at your, at your niche, you find it and then you stay in that lane and you don't try to, uh, deviate too much from that. Right. You, you trust the research that got you there. You you know, say, how did we get when here? When you say find it though, how do you, how do you do that initial? Well, I mean, you know, so for example, um, you know, say you're going to get into a, a, a niche, um, say you were going to, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think of something. Office chairs, right? So you're going to get into the office chair game, and you're actually going to start. And let's assume you're not white labeling, you know, to your earlier point, because unfortunately, that is a very common uh, thing you see today. Is just white labels everywhere. You know, it's no one really makes anything. They're just slapping a logo on it. So let's put that aside for a minute, and let's assume that you're actually making office chairs, right? So off the top of my head, because I'm actually buying office chairs right now for our new office. I know that right now there are plenty of cheap office chairs that you can buy on Amazon for you know, 150 bucks. Um, there's a few middle grade ones you can get like at an office depot. They're kind of like the Herman Miller knockoffs I tend to buy for my, my team. They're about $400. You know, they're, they're really good and ergonomic. And then you go from there all the way up to those Herman Millers that, you know, are a thousand to 1500 and, and, and there. And, so like right now, if I'm looking at those office chairs, I would say there's a couple of gaps probably. There's probably a, a, a gap right around that $200 mark, and there's probably a gap right around that five $600 mark. Um, and and this is, again, off the top of my head. I mean, just don't anyone take this at uh, you know, take this at face value, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So not, but, not an office chair expert, but... <laughs> I'm not an office chair expert, yes. I claim to know very little, but... <laughs> In that example, let's just assume that we run the analysis and we plot everything out pricing wise and we, you know, look at, you know, value versus comfort versus luxury versus options and, and build a little matrix and, and kind of plot it all out. And we find, wow, there really is a void for a $200 office chair. There's lots of garbage ones. And then you get in that 400, but that $200 price point's great. We think we can make a better office chair for $200 and that's a sweet spot. Um, you just, you got to commit to that then and make the best $200 office chair that you can. If that's, if that's what you're going to do. Mm, okay. So you, so you would start kind of, you take a step back and say, I want to create an office chair, but at that point, it's still not decided what level of office chair. Then you start looking at the landscape, plot out who's making office chairs, what price point, how do you think they right. rank versus each other? And then start figuring out where you <clears> kind of wedge yourself into that. Kind of yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I would say that that's accurate. I would say that, I mean, clearly there's probably something that led you to office shares in the first place. You probably, I'm guessing you thought that you had some way to do it better or a design or something like that. But, um, you know, I mean, in the, in the case of chassis, I, I already explained that, you know, our formula dictated our price point, right? I mean, you know, we, and I say this all the time, we can make this product for, less than half the price, probably a, a quarter of the price that we're making it for if we wanted to. It wouldn't work nearly as well. It wouldn't perform nearly as well, but we could do that. Um, and then obviously with, you know, one third to one quarter of the cost of goods sold, we could drop our price considerably at the same time. If, again, if we, if we wanted to go that route. But when we decided to make the world's best powder and put the best stuff in it, it drove that cost of goods up pretty high to the point where anybody with any experience at all in, in CPG would say, well, you're going to have to have a premium price if you want to make any money. Right? We, we couldn't sell this for $7 a bottle. You know, it just, it was never going to happen. So, I mean, in other words, like in that case, we kind of let the product dictate it. And then, you know, you have a little bit of wiggle room on where you want your ultimate pricing to be, but we can, we're never going to be a, 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 a drugstore product. You know, 
Yeah. So you kind of, once you started with that, what chemical, what kind of ingredients went into it, that kind of dictated, okay, so now out of this whole huge map of, you know, your office ship map, you're like, all right, we have to be at least in this section over here. We can't, like, if we want these ingredients, we just can't be over there. So that kind of started there. Now you have to figure out, okay, yeah. how are we, is there no one above us? Are we really like the highest end one? Or is there some little wedge that we're jumping into here? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, then you get into a whole, you know, price elasticity equation. That's a whole another topic, you know, you know, you can get into a whole economics discussion there and, you know, how elastic is your pricing and, um, you know, ours isn't terribly so. I mean, we've, it, it's surprisingly, we could run a sale and, don't see a huge difference either way, you know? So I think that, um, you know, again, but our, our, our repeat purchase is, is so high right now, um, that, you know, once you start using it, it's, it's really, it's, it's something you're going to probably use for the rest of your life, you know, and, and just really become a part of your, your grooming routine. So, you know, and honestly for, for most guys now, um, you know, okay, is it eighteen dollars a bottle? Is it twenty dollars a bottle? Is it twenty five dollars a bottle? You know, for the average working guy, if it's something that's important to you, you're probably not going to give a whole lot of thought to that. You know, for something that's that's good. You know. Yeah, and they kind of think you know something your toothpaste or deodorant. You kind of consumables you use all the time. At some point, you just stop looking at the price. You just know that's the exact like you almost have like a picture, and that you just follow the picture and you skip over the price. And you just know eh, it's roughly. It's roughly once you kind of purchase it once, you're like, it's it's right at this price. I don't really care anymore. I'm just going to keep buying it, um, and that's what you do. Kind of, I don't know if just men, but I know that's at least yeah, what I it's do. yeah, it is. And I mean, w one of the interesting things about grooming that you know, there's all this research in the world that says that uh, you know, um, the in fact during the '08 recession, um, there's all these studies that show that uh, uh, premium grooming products and premium beauty products did not suffer very much during the recession and the the theory behind it is that even if you you know can no longer afford your nice car or maybe you had to downsize your house or maybe you even lost your house um these little luxuries in your life you know like a nice for a guy a nice bottle of powder or maybe a nice bottle of nail polish for a woman can make you feel good um and and and, and there's there's some value to that because at the end of the day I mean, you know, for most guys, you know, 15 to 20 dollars isn't going to break the bank either way. But if it makes you feel better, um, it's it's kind of like a, 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 a an attainable luxury. Right. Yeah. But but it's not like, you know, buying a new Mercedes or something like that. Gotcha. So, so now once you kind of decide that's that's the lane you want to be in, that should niche kind of go in for that. How do you convey that to the customer? How do you from a branding point of view, how do you actually tell them like other than. So he said it's a clean design, that sort of thing, but in the price. So those are kind of the two basic things, but how else, how are you really conveying them the story and like who we are and this is yeah. who we are as a brand? So, I mean, I think that, you know, number one, we tell the story. So a lot of the narrative that I, I started the, this interview with, I, you know, is right on our website. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, it is, it is getting harder in a way because nobody reads anymore. Uh, and I, I don't mean that flippantly, but I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, you know, we, we like to look at pretty pictures now. So, you know, the way that we have to tell our narrative now versus the way that we had to tell our narrative even three years ago has changed in that we have to do it a lot more with images and icons and graphics and things like that. So, you know, you've got your, 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 your graphics. Um, you may have a little comparison chart, you know, comparing, chassis to a baby powder and a medicated powder and showing all the features that, that we have that, that they don't have. Um, you know, so those are, those are some of the things that, you know, you, you have to do. And again, it's done more with imagery anymore than, than long form narrative. Mm, okay. So even on, so like an Amazon product listing, um, you, you're leveraging images. So you're saying more than before it's kind of, Oh, way moment. more. Really? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you have, you have to, I mean, it's just like, we, we see it all the time is, I mean, and then just look at your own, you know, go, go look at an Amazon listing or, or just a Shopify site. And you know, it's those, you're going to slide through the image carousel and those images can have little words on it, right? Little call outs or little features. But, um, you know, I mean, it's, people are, are making decisions faster than ever. And, and so much of it is that first impression, you know, having good photography, having a great brand name, 
um, having a lot of good reviews. I mean, these are the things that matter. And, you know, that's that's where a lot of the first mover strategy comes from with e-commerce, of course, is, you know, the whole, you know, we were first we were the first ones there, you know. So, um, you know, the reality is, um, you know, our, our reviews continue to accumulate and, you know, somebody could try to undercut us. But at the end of the day, you know, we've got that 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 lead dog position. Um, and now it's ours to lose. I mean, we could screw it up somehow and lose it by not, you know, continuing to make a great product by, uh, letting our customers down by, you know, making bad decisions, you know, so, uh, we still have to do our job, but, um, you know, that's what the first mover advantage is all about. Hmm. Where do you plan to take things from here? Is it, is it building a brand now of different complementary products? Is it, yeah. you know, version two yeah. of this product like what do you go from here now so we've got two more uh chassis products in the pipeline one coming out uh at the end of this year um another one probably coming out uh early part of next year uh we are working on another brand um i can't quite uh go too much into it but we're working on another brand totally to- All, totally separate brand totally own. separate brand okay. yeah totally different brand name um also in the men's grooming space um also actually we're, yeah so also the men's grooming space and also sort of taking advantage of a niche that we've, we've found, you know, solving a problem that a lot of guys have that there really isn't a great product in that particular price point currently. Um, and then we're also working on one more brand. This one's a little further out, probably another year or so out one more brand. Um, that's actually going to be our first unisex brand, uh, we think, but as of now, it's going to be a unisex brand. Um, again, uh, serving a niche that, um, currently has, uh, uh, one, uh, provider, one, one manufacturer. Um, but they, we think they're vulnerable. Um, and from a branding standpoint, we know we can run circles around them because the, the brand for that, that leader in that space is, um, very 1980s, let's just say. So, uh, we, we think we can, uh, uh, improve upon that. And from a branding standpoint, really capture a younger audience that, that would never consider a brand with that, uh, that look and feel. So you said, you said an interesting thing there. There's different products you're going to launch under the chassis brand, but there's also different brands you're going to launch, right? So there's two different things. What's, what is the thought process? Like, what is the decision-making process on what you'd want to put inside the chassis brand versus what you'd want to re- well, go, it's through, a great, go through the work of creating a new brand? Because there's a lot yeah, more great, work there. Great question. So I, and, and this, is a, this is a tough thing because I, I think that we, we debated a lot internally. Um, you know, the chassis brand name is, is very well known. Um, that said, our tagline is man care for down there. That's our tagline. That was the the line in the sand that we drew. Could we lose that tagline and then start making deodorant and soap and all sorts of different things, shaving gel? We could. Um, and that crossed our mind. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that's where you lose a little bit of that brand promise potentially because, you know, now we've gone from man care for down there, but now trust us, we've got the best shaving gel. You know, I, I don't know that I would fall for that. You know, as a consumer, I would I would have doubts that that you're, you know, you were the best powder, and now you're saying you're going to have a, a great shaving gel. Uh, I don't know. So I mean, but again, it's up for debate. I mean, believe me, that was a very intense debate internally. Um, I don't know that there's a right or wrong. But the path that we've chosen is to say, look, we're, we're solving problems and we can do that at a brand level as opposed to, you know, creating one brand that does everything, you know, like the Google way or the general electric way of doing things. Yeah, because you see people go both routes, right? So like, yeah. it can work in either direction because it absolutely can. And you've invested the chassis brand. It's an asset now, right? That's something that it is you've built over time and people believe in that. And as followers that if you come up with you know, whatever the other brand name is, they're not, and you sell it to the same folks, they might not even realize you're related in that kind of trust you have with the chassis. You need to mm-hmm. rebuild that with another brand. Absolutely. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's a risk. It's a risk. But I, I think then I would also say, you know, so imagine again, back to that scenario where um, all of a sudden this tagline goes away and instead of man care for down there, maybe it just says man care. I don't know. And now all of a sudden you're, shop and chassis and you realize, wait a second, these guys do shaving cream, they do soap, they do blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, it, are, are they the best anymore or are they just, you know, another mass brand that does 
everything okay? Um, and I, you know, look again, I don't, I'm not saying there's a right or wrong. Um, but I think, you know, we've made the decision. That's, that's the best approach for us. Mm, okay. So, so. You, yeah, cause there, so what would you think with the folks that when they, they come out of the gate with the general brand and they just think, you know, we'll use brand, like, instead of being very niche down, they just say, you know what, let's just come up instead of skincare for down there sort of thing, you start, come up with just men's skincare and that's like how you start that's genesis right what do you think about that approach and then just kind we, of deciding, look, i mean know. if we could if we could rewind the clock maybe yeah but again i i don't know i mean look i mean there are i mean let me say this there are a few men's grooming brands i won't name names that also make powder okay it's not as good as our powder but they make powder and it's marketed in a similar fashion but those the, a couple of those brands are, you know, have a hundred other SKUs, you know, you name it, they're making it everything from lip balm to shaving cream to hair gel and everything in between their, their sales of that powder don't even come close to, to this. Right. So, you know, I mean that, that could be some evidence right there that show, and these are huge brands that, that, that anyone would, would, would love to be a part of, right. I'm not knocking these brands. And if you were to add up those hundred SKUs that they have, it's a mat. These are massive companies you're talking about here, right? So I'm, I'm not throwing any stones, but at the same time, they're way behind where we are in the niche that we're in. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that's one of those things you can. There's much larger brands, so you can go out there. These and consumer packaged good brands are the juggernauts, right, of industry where they're just these these beats, right? But the only it sounds like one way you've kind of found to compete with them is just go very like a laser into a very specific need. Like you are this exact product for this exact type of person. Like you can't, you can't go head to head with the juggernaut, with this like monster, right? You, but you can win in a very specific place. And that when you're talking, you know, it's still big enough where there's a lot there, where it's not just, you know, it, it's still a very large market, but not enough for the large companies to go that deep into. That's right. And I think, you know, you, you combine that with the fact that a lot of these larger companies that came around before the e-commerce side of things, they also are way behind when it comes to e-commerce marketing. I mean, it's 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 actually kind of funny. I mean, you know, the next time you're on Amazon, take a look at the really big brands and what their presence looks like on Amazon and then compare that to maybe some of the more you know, smaller upstart brands. And you'll see how far behind the eight ball a lot of these big brands are because they've never had to do it before. You know, they they were just worried about shelf space at uh, you know at Walmart and stuff like that. And uh, you know, obviously, it's a you know when you talk about shelf space at Walmart or ranking in Amazon, you know, it's two totally different things. And so um, it has leveled the playing field, and I think it's enabled companies like us who know what we're doing and who take a real cerebral approach to it. You know, we can we can achieve some pretty amazing things. Awesome. I think that's a good place to end it, Ben. That's super insightful. Um, if folks want to find you, kind of learn more about you, where are some links we can put in the show notes? Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, Chassis for Men, C H A S S I S, like the chassis of a car. Chassisformen.com is is our, our uh, website. Um, Level six marketing, the number six. Um, that's my uh, agency site. And uh, yeah, appreciate you having me. Awesome. Thanks. Great chatting with you. Have a good one. Thanks. You too. Thank you.